Facts that can be found in the Quran that leave us awestruck. How could this information be in a book 1,400 years old? And we were looking at those verses in the Quran concerning the development of the human fetus in the womb. And we also were reading a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. When the Prophet Muhammad mentioned that when 42 nights have passed over the conceptus, Allah sends an angel to it who shapes it, makes its ears and eyes and skin and flesh and bones. And then he says, O oh Lord, is it a male or a female? And your Lord decides what he wishes and an angel records it. So it is at the 42nd day or just after the 40th day that it only then becomes identifiable. And this is a fact. This is a scientific fact. Um, and it's very interesting. It's true also that the Prophet Muhammad mentioned that there are some things that the knowledge of it is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things the Prophet mentioned is what is the sex of the, the child in the womb. We also find that the hadith mentions the correct time for the recognizable growth of the features described. And the sex of the fetus can only definitely be determined after 42 days. Now this piece of information was only known after the invention of powerful microscopes only decades ago. But what I thought I would do is mention a quote from Keith Moore, who is the professor and chairman of the Department of Anatomy from the University of Toronto in Canada. And Keith Moore is one of the acknowledged experts in the field of the developing human being in its embryonic form. And he was shown some of the statements in the Quran and the hadith or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad uh, concerning the development of the human embryo. And having studied them, he came to a conclusion. And this is what he said. Until the 19th century, nothing was known about the classification of the stages of human development. A system of staging human embryos was developed around the end of the 19th century, based upon alphabetical symbols. And during the 20th century, numerals were used to describe 23 stages of embryonic development. This system of numbering the stages is not easy to follow and a better system would be based on the morphological changes. In recent years, the study of the Quran has revealed another basis for the classification of the stages of developing embryo, which is based on easily understood actions and changes in shape. It utilizes terms that were used and sent by God to Prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel and recorded in the Quran. And he goes on to say, it is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from God because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been a messenger of God or Allah. Dear viewers, you need to think about this. Here is one of the experts, perhaps the expert in the field, examining the information that is in the Quran and that has been mentioned on the tongue of the Prophet Muhammad. And he is saying that not only is it impossible for this information to have been known by anyone 1,400 years ago. He also suggests that modern embryology should follow the system of development that has been mentioned in the Quranic verses. This is what Keith Moore is saying, who, by the way, has become a Muslim. How did the Prophet Muhammad develop this information? 
from where did a man living in the desert 1,400 years ago know? This is the question that you have to ask. The next thing we want to look at is the water cycle where the sun heats the sea and causes evaporation and from that evaporation we have clouds forming and how the winds move those clouds and from that rain falls. Now the Quran accurately describes the water cycle and the origin of underground springs. Um, in fact it was not until the 18th century that the water cycle was really accurately described. Yet the Quran says 1400 years ago in the 39th surah in the 21st ayah have you not seen that Allah sent water down from the sky and led it through sources into the ground. This is a simple but in fact highly accurate description of a water cycle. Another amazing fact that is mentioned in the Quran, we find in the 24th surah of the Quran in the 40th verse. And it's talking about the state of those people who disbelieve and reject faith in God. The Quran describes the state of the disbeliever, the person who has rejected faith, like a darkness. A darkness that is so dark, it is like the deep depths of darkness in a vast deep ocean, overwhelmed with wave upon wave. If a man stretches out his hand, he can hardly see it. For any to whom Allah gives no light, there is no light. Now, on the surface, here Allah is giving a simple description. On the surface, we have a very poetic, we have a very, a very strong and vigorous and, and amazing description of this darkness and the state of being lost. Yet when we examine it in more detail, there is something else going on here as well. There is a clue to some scientific truths. First of all, the Quran describes a vast deep ocean and it describes waves upon waves. Now, of course, most of us are familiar with the waves that are on top of the ocean. But what does it mean waves upon waves? Are there other waves in the ocean? Well, we're going to find out. Also, the Quran talks about a person being deprived of light that they can hardly see. Now, a ray of light is composed of seven colors. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. And light, when it hits water, goes through what is called refraction. That means that, for example, in the upper 10 to 15 meters, the water absorbs the red color. And as you go deeper, each of the colors in the spectrum become absorbed by the water until you get to a depth of below about 1000 meters there is complete darkness now what is amazing is that we also find in modern scientific discoveries that internal waves cover the deep waters of the seas and oceans because the deep waters have a higher density than the waters above them. So waves upon waves. We have the internal waves in the deep, deep ocean, and then we have the waves on top of the ocean. And then the clouds and so on and so forth, they add to the darkness and the disparity and the, the breaking up and the refracting of light. Now what is interesting is the deep darkness, remember the Quran says, they stretch out their hand, they can hardly see it. This deep darkness begins below the internal waves in the ocean. In fact, there are certain fish down at those depths which need their own lights in order to be able to see. And amazingly, Allah has created these creatures that can actually generate their own lights. Now this is really amazing because of course until very recently no one has been able to penetrate and to reach those deep parts of the ocean 
it is only with extremely sophisticated modern machinery and submarines and diving suits that someone has been able to go down to that depth. Yet we have the Quran 1,400 years ago describing the internal waves of the oceans and the darkness that is there at the depths of the oceans. How on earth could a man living in the desert 1,400 years ago have known about such detailed information about a science like oceanography? Well, Professor Rao, who is an expert in marine biology at the King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah, says, 1,400 years ago, a normal human being could not explain this phenomenon in so much detail. This information must have been coming from a supernatural source. My dear viewers, this even is not the end of the amazing scientific statements in the Quran. Because the next thing I want to deal with is cosmology. The statements in the Quran concerning the universe. Now, until recently, or we could say up until the 1960s, there was a major controversy between scientists concerning the state of the universe. Now, some scientists believe and have begun to develop the idea that the universe was in a state of flux, that the universe was in fact expanding. And from this theory of the expanding universe also came another theory which is commonly known today as the Big Bang Theory. This is the idea that the universe had a common origin in a singularity. The universe was a infinitely small, we could say, part of dense matter. And this infinitely small dense matter then exploded into what is the universe that we know today. Now this was opposed by the static state theory, and this was very much preferred theory of atheists, that the universe was the way it was eternally in the past and will keep on being that way eternally in the future. Uh, and this was a theory that was really largely based, at least initially, and was believed in by Albert Einstein. And many people therefore followed on from that with this idea of the static state theory. And so this idea of the Big Bang theory, which was, you know, really held by Fred Hoyle, he was the person who uh, supported this theory, uh, and Lemaitre, who was opposing it, with the idea of the Big Bang Theory. Now, evidence came to light that showed that variations in the light spectrum that were being emitted from galaxies and stars, which is called redshift, showed in fact that the universe is expanding. And it's amazing that this scientific fact that has now been confirmed and it is agreed upon by almost unanimously all scientists in the field that we live in an expanding universe and the evidence very very clearly and strongly suggests that. What does the Quran say? Before there were telescopes and all the means to discover this information the Quran says in the 51st surah, in the 47th ayah, the heaven, we have built it with power and we are expanding it. Let's just repeat that again. The heaven, we have built it with power and we are expanding it. The next most important observational evidence was the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation in 1964 by a powerful telescope and this had been predicted in the Big Bang Theory as a relic of the hot ionized plasma of the early universe 
when it first cooled sufficiently to form neutral hydrogen and allowed space to become transparent to light. And its discovery led to the general acceptance among physicists that the Big Bang is the best model for the origin and evolution of the universe. What does the Quran say in the 21st surah, in the 30th ayah? Have not those who disbelieved known that the heavens and the earth were joined together as one united piece, then we parted them, and we have made from water every living thing. Will they not then believe? The common origin of the universe, or the singularity that scientists believe today the universe originated from, and which led to the Big Bang, it is considered that the conditions of this singularity were so precise, it is almost inconceivable that it could be in that way, except that it has been made by an all-wise and powerful creator. The Qur'an also mentions that Allah turned to the heavens when it was Dukhan. And the word Dukhan in Arabic means smoke. This also accurately describes the hot gaseous mass of the universe before the galaxies and the stars began to be formed. So here we have the Qur'an, 1400 years ago, talking about the expanding universe, talking about the common origin of the universe, that the heavens and the earth were one, talking about the gaseous state, the smoke-like state of the early universe. This is in a book 1400 years old, mentioning facts that scientists have only begun to discover today. And we have created from every living thing water. It's a fact that every living thing has its basis in and is fundamentally composed of water. You and me are about 70 to 80% water, a fact that has been mentioned in the Quran 1,400 years ago. Will you not believe? What will it take to make you realize and to understand that the Quran is the truth? That Muhammad is the messenger of God? This is more evidence, the proof that Islam is the truth. Let's look at some more verses of the Quran concerning cosmology. One of the verses we want to mention is that Allah is the one who created the night and the day, the sun and moon. Each one is traveling in an orbit with its own motion. Now it's interesting that the Arabic word referring to movement with self-propelled motion is the verb sabaha. And yasbahuna is what the actual text mentions. Now, this implies a motion that comes from the body in question itself. So if it takes place in water, it means to swim. If it means on land, it means to walk. So the implication is the movement is coming from the body itself. So if it was talking about something in space, it would mean to rotate. It would itself rotate. Now, this is amazing. The Qur'an is talking 1,400 years ago about the earth and the moon and the sun rotating. If you are perhaps thinking that the sun is static, it's not. The sun, as does the earth, as does the moon, they all rotate. Of course, the earth, however, rotates around the sun. The sun rotates around its own axis. So it is actually quite correct is saying. And of course the earth is in orbit around the sun. And also, by the way, the sun is also in orbit. But it is in orbit around the center of the galaxy. In fact, it is believed that ultimately, if the sun keeps going in its orbit, it would ultimately end in what is known as the solar apex, a sort of position that it will end up in the center of the galaxy. The idea of the alternation of the night and the day and of the spherical nature of the earth 
is actually implied in the 31st surah and the 29th ayah of the Quran. Have you not seen how Allah merges the night into the day and the day into the night? And in another verse, the 39th chapter in the 5th ayah or the 5th verse, the Quran mentioned he coils the night upon the day and he coils the day upon the night. And this word that is used in the Quran in the original Arabic is kawarra. Kawarra in its original meaning means the action of coiling a turban around your head. Coiling a turban. So it describes kawarra, how the night and the day coils one round the other. And you can find that description of the interpenetration of one sector by another is expressed in the Quran just as if the concept of the earth's roundness had already been conceived at the time. There were a few philosophers who had theorized that the earth was round, but it was not really a generally accepted idea. But it is something that is implied in the Quran and certainly we can gather this today from our present day knowledge. It's a very another interesting aspect that in one place in the Quran, the word that is used to describe the shape of the earth is the same word that is used to describe the egg of the ostrich. Now, looking at this globe, for example, you may imagine that the earth is completely spherical. But in reality, that is not the case. The earth is slightly misshaped. It is not a perfect sphere. And in fact, slightly elongated, rather like an ostrich egg. So it is incredible also that the Quran is describing that shape of the earth. At least this is a possible interpretation of those verses. Certainly we can say that none of these things actually contradict present modern scientific knowledge. In the 10th surah, in the 5th ayah, it is He, meaning God, Allah, who made the sun a shining lamp and the moon as a light and measured out their stages. Now the Quran describes the sun as siraj. Now the word siraj means torch means it's something that generates its own heat and light. Whereas the, the moon is described as a nur. Now a nur means a light that is originating from another source. And of course, this is the correct understanding. The moon reflects the light of the sun. It's common knowledge today, but not necessarily so in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Let's see what one of the respected cosmologists and scientists in the field of astronomy had to say when he was shown some of the statements in the Quran concerning his field of expertise. Professor Yushidi Kusan, who's the director of the Tokyo Observatory in Tokyo in Japan, and this is what he said, I say, I am very much impressed by finding true astronomical facts in the Quran. And for us modern astronomers who have been studying a very small piece of the universe, we have concentrated our efforts for understanding that very small part. Because by using telescopes, we can only see a very few parts of the sky without thinking about the whole universe. So by reading the Quran, and by answering to questions, I think I can find my future way for investigating the universe. What he's saying is that the one who is writing the Quran, the one who is revealing the Quran, the one who is speaking the words of the Quran, is talking as if he is looking at the whole universe together, as opposed to the scientist who concentrates on observing this bit or that bit of the universe, which is what most astronomers do. Who is it that sees the whole universe altogether? Who is it 
who sees all things in all places in all times except Allah the mighty the wise so these are some of the amazing scientific facts and we're going to move on also to another area that particularly interested me because when I was at school one of the subjects that I studied was geography and a sub subject of that was of course geology and I do remember when I first read the Quran 20 years ago and it was reading the Quran that motivated me to embrace Islam one of the things that stuck in my head and I remember it until today was coming across the descriptions in the Quran of mountains for example in the 78th surah in verses 6 to 7 Allah says have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountains stakes the word that is used here is otad otad meaning stake is like the, the peg of the tent so the peg of the tent goes into the ground it holds the rope that holds the tent so you have a small part of the peg sticking up from the ground but the majority of the peg is inside the ground the Quran also says in the 31st surah in the 10th verse and Allah has cast into the mountains standing firm so that it does not shake with you now today with modern sonar technology they have been able to bounce sound waves down through the earth's crust and according to the different rates at which the sound waves are reflected back and are measured they can tell the different density of the earth's crust as opposed to what is hard and what is soft what is from the crust and what is from the magna and what they have discovered with this technology is exactly what the Quran was saying 1400 years ago that the mountains have roots the mountains like the peg of the tent not only do they go, go above the earth's surface the mountains go deeply into the earth core and they act it has been theorized as stabilizers they help to stabilize the earth's surface and there's two ways in which they do that number one because the earth is composed of tectonic plates the crust of the earth is actually made of different plates and it is the movement of these plates that causes earthquakes when these plates move against each other the friction of that movement causes earthquakes and that's also what they think how continental drift has happened originally they believe all the continents were one continent and then because of plate tectonics it moved but the Quran is saying is the mountains act as stabilizers they help to stabilize the earth's crust and this is something that has actually been theorized by modern geologists there's another way in which the mountains may act as a stabilizing factor and that is to do with the rotation maybe if you try and spin something you will find that if it is not really spherical it will not it will start to ro rotate and then it will start to wobble out of shape and it is possible that the mountains actually act as a counterbalance to keep the earth's rotation smooth I do stress of course that these are theories but it is very interesting what the Quran is saying 1400 years ago and that it seems to be preempting the ideas and the knowledge that is being produced by modern day science certainly it is a fact that is established that the mountains have roots and the Quran is saying that the mountains are like altar the pegs of a tent so this is a remarkable scientific fact it's also the Quran mentions some aspects of animal and plant life for example the 16th chapter of the Quran is called Surah Al-Nahl which means the Surah of the Bee and one of the aspects of the Quran in this Surah it is talking about the bee and it's very interesting that the word that is used in the Quran for the bee that flies around gathering honey or gathering the nectar for the honey it is used in the female form the gender that it is used is feminine although until recently it was believed that the bees were actually soldiers they were males and the ruler of the hive was a king but as it happens in fact we know 
that the bees are indeed female and they are owned or they are headed by a queen that's why we say the queen bee it's also true that the Quran mentions that plants have different genders and the winds are a means of fertilization for the plants so in the 15th chapter of the Quran in the 22nd verse it says that we meaning Allah the Creator this is the we of nobility it does not mean there is more than one God of course we sent forth the winds that fessantate that means that the fertilized things these are all recently discovered things also we find the Greek philosopher Democritus who lived from 460 to 361 BC he advanced the theory that matter was composed of tiny indivisible particles called atoms and they believed that this was the base upon which all of things were made and there was nothing smaller than the atom however modern science has discovered that atom is in fact divisible and the atom has been split and the atom itself is composed of smaller elements the Quran says 1400 years ago in the 34th chapter and the third ayah or the third verse he is aware of an atom's weight in the heavens and on the earth and even anything smaller than that. Meaning there is something smaller than an atom and Allah, God, is aware of it. Every single thing. There's another thing I want to mention. God mentions in the Quran some amazing things about the human beings. And one of the things is about our nerves. Here is a very frightening and terrifying passage of the Quran. It's mentioned in the 75th chapter in Ayahs 3 to 4. Does mankind think that we cannot assemble his bones? Nay, we are able to put together in perfect order the very tips of his fingers. God is telling us he can recreate us on this day, this terrifying day, this frightening day, the day of judgment. He is able to recreate you, even if you are dust, even your bones to the very tip of your finger. Why the very tip of your finger? Of course, you've all heard of fingerprinting, haven't you? Every single human being's fingerprint is unique. Why did God mention the fingerprint? Why did God mention the tip of the finger? This is the uniqueness of the human being. God is telling us, look, I can recreate you even to this fingertip. That is the power that I have. Even to your most unique attribute, I can create you to that. Be mindful, be careful. I will create you again on the day of judgment and I will judge you and ask you about every single thing that you have done. This is not common knowledge. How did anyone 1400 years ago know about fingerprinting? My dear listeners, our invitation is to invite you to his mercy, to his guidance and his forgiveness by accepting these truths, the proof that Islam is the truth.